The following program, Live and Learn, is made possible by Aging Partners. Find out more on their website. Hello and welcome to Live and Learn. I'm your host, Jerry Renault. It is time to start thinking about the fall exercise schedule through Aging Partners. Lots of great classes, and we have a great guest today, Tracy Foreman, who is a personal trainer and a community health educator with Aging Partners. She's going to tell us all about the classes. You don't want to miss it. Hi, I'm Lita Peldrick, and welcome to the, our very special show. Today, we've got Maury Enders from the Lincoln Community Playhouse, and he's going to tell you all, all of the wonderful plays that are going to be coming up soon. Please, stay with us. I think you'll enjoy it. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Live and Learn. My name's Kim Hachia. My guests today and I are going to be talking about the Cascade Fountain Project and other things that um, Lincoln Parks and Recreation are doing. So stay tuned. It's a good segment. Hello and welcome to Live and Learn. I'm your host, Jerry Renault. A rather unique event has taken place in the city of Lincoln over the last few weeks, and that is the naming of a high school after a specific person. It will be named after Chief Standing Bear. Here to give us her thoughts about the impact of that decision is Judy Gashkabosh. She's the executive director of the Nebraska Commission on Indian Affairs. Don't go away. This and more on today's Live and Learn. From the stomach, again, bring your hands up and touch your fingers, working into the shoulders a little. Welcome to Live and Learn. You've been watching an example of one of the fitness classes offered by Aging Partners, and if you've never taken a class, you do not know what you are missing. It's great fun, and it's a great way to help you improve your health. Hello, everyone. Welcome again to Live and Learn. I'm your host, Jerry Renault. We want to talk about some of those classes and we want to talk about some ways that you can help improve your health and improve your fitness. And there is nobody better uh, to have on our program to talk about that, and that is Tracy Foreman. Uh, she is a personal trainer, a community health educator with Aging Partners, teaches many of the classes, helps you out at the fitness center. So yes. Tracy, thanks for, uh, for being with us today. Thanks for having me, Jerry. Before we get into some of the specifics about the classes, um, you know, life's been interesting this last year or so. Um, you've been teaching the classes. They've all been on Zoom. Yes. And, and those have been fun and interesting, but you're mm -hmm. this lonely person in a, in a room with music. <laughs> and stuff. now we think we're moving at least into an area where we're going to have more in-person classes. I am very much looking forward to that, and I'm guessing you are are too. That's got to be a little nicer to have people in the room with you. All of our instructors have realized that they are definitely people <laughs> oriented so it is going to be good to get out there. Yeah it's people. nice to have that conversation back and forth sometimes. I know that in, in the Zoom classes you have to tell everybody to turn the audio off because otherwise it moves around with the camera so um, yes. I think everybody is looking forward to, uh, to taking um, a, a class in person. Although um, some people have gotten comfortable with the Zoom classes as well, so you are going to continue to offer those as well, right? We will continue to offer those just because we've had lots of requests for that. Sure. Okay, um, let's talk about um, some of the classes. Um, we have, uh, there's going to be a flyer that's, that is out um, that's going to be on the Aging Partners website. Uh, and we're going to show you a little graphic of that a little bit later on and, and listing all of the classes. So there is some information there. But there are a couple of classes that uh, are not at least on that flyer for right now. And I think those are valuable and important classes. So um, let's, let's talk about that. Um, the first one is called Stepping on Building Confidence and Reducing Falls. Um, that's, a, that's a long name, but... Lots of the classes um, that, are, that are taught deal with balance and trying to make sure that people you know, don't find themselves in that situation. I have a good friend whose mother just had a fall, broke a hip, had to spend several months in a rehabilitation center, and um, that's not fun. We want to avoid that as, as much as we can. So let's, let's talk a little bit about this class. Well, we know that balance changes as we get older, and because of medications and health issues, it can affect your balance in other ways also. So Aging Partners got on board with an evidence-based program that came out of Australia, and it's called Stepping On. It is a six-week class, and we've had great success with it, and people tell us who have taken the class that it really has improved their balance. So I want to dispel that misconception that Stepping On is 
just a just an exercise class it is not we have a set of eight core exercises that we do in the class but it's a six-week class that that really covers many topics such as uh, proper movement, proper shoes, medications and how they affect our balance, vision and how it affects our balance. And throughout the six week series, we have experts that come in and talk to them. So it's not just the facilitators doing the class, it's experts coming in and talking to them about these issues, so. Very good, and you can see um, that we have, it's gonna be at Eastmont Towers, Yes. Um, which is right about 63rd and O Streets. It'll be Tuesdays from 2.30 to 4.30, and it starts on October 5th and goes through November 16th. So, um, so this is a great class. Is there any, um, um, how many numbers? Is there is a problem in, in terms of getting into the, into we, the class? I would really encourage people <clears throat> to get signed up because we do start a list of people, and these classes fill up very quickly. We have a limit of 20 that can come to the class. Our two beloved nurses are going to be teaching this class, so, and there will be a physical therapist working with them also, so it's, it's gonna be a good one. Okay, and I good. encourage people to get signed up. Okay, very good. Yes. Okay, so let's talk about uh, a second class that uh, is not on the flyer um, at this point. There'll be some more information that will come about um, yes. um, in, in a short while, but let's, uh, let's talk about, it's a class that deals with diabetes. Yes. And diabetes, as, as we get older, uh, yeah. starts to become um, more of a problem and more of a reality for uh, a lot of people as the, as the body just starts changing. So yes. there's going to be um, a couple of classes um, that are going to deal with any number of topics concerning diabetes. And there, there you see it's living well with diabetes. Um, let's talk about this first one very quickly. It's uh, at the Gear Library on Tuesdays from 1 to 3. And it starts August 24th. And as we are taping this program right. in, in late August, and so this will be airing throughout the month of, of September, this, this class will be underway. It may be a little bit of a challenge to get into this one. Is that right? Correct. We are setting a limit on this class of 16, and so we have some uh, space restrictions. So 16 will be the top number that we can take, but um, if they can't get into this class, we have several signed up right now, but if they can't, then I would encourage them to look at the October class that will be coming up October 12th through November 16th. That is in Hickman, Nebraska. We will also have classes coming up in the future after the first of the year. So I would encourage people to call us, get on the list, and ask us what uh, the future brings to after the first. So. We'll have lots of classes, but get on this October list. Yeah, so. I think that's a, a great idea. Let's talk about some of the things that will that that you're going to talk about, or that aging partners will talk about during this. There's, is, there is a there's a, a whole list of, of different kinds of, of things of how do you talk to your doctor, how does food interact. Uh, let let's talk about some of the specifics, at least just for a, a minute or two, about the kinds of things that people could expect when they show up. Well, food is a huge issue and people really don't understand the, the carb ratios and how to count your, your carbs when you have diabetes, whether it's type 1 or type 2. And we're going to talk about the different types of diabetes in there. We're going to help them to understand how food works with their blood sugars, how to monitor their blood sugars, some of the new things that are available for them in terms of monitoring. We'll talk about the insulin pumps if they are a type 1 uh, person living with diabetes. We'll talk about, like as you said, talking to their doctor and how important that is. We're going to talk about challenging themselves to do action plans and to achieve certain goals as they move along because it is a complete lifestyle change when you are diagnosed with diabetes. So we'll talk about exercise and diabetes. And yeah, getting... that's one of those things people I, I sometimes forget about, uh, that they go, well, I don't think I can go out and do that. And that's just the wrong way to look at that, isn't it? It is. It is. And exercise uh, is very important with diabetes and can lower blood sugars pretty rapidly. So it's important to talk about that. And different things they can do to, to control their blood sugars, so. Sure. Yeah. Okay, so uh, great class. We, we really encourage people, um, if they have questions about that, um, mm -hmm. to, to at least think about 
getting into one of these classes and, and looking down the road because, as you say, it's an important topic and one that will continue uh, to be a part of, of what Aging Partners is going to and, and talk this, about and deal with. This class is also an evidence-based class and has been researched at Stanford, but boy, get signed up because they fill up very, very quickly. Okay, very yeah. good. Um, another uh, a class that um, I know we've had some questions about, and that is the Tai Chi class, um, yes. and particularly the 24 form. Yes, um, sure. And I know for any number of reasons that um, you're not going to be able to offer it um, uh, as a regular class this fall. I know you're talking about trying to do at least a few sessions in, mm -hmm. in the park somewhere. It might yeah. be kind of fun. Yes, yes. Uh, we actually just don't have enough staff to be able to go out and do a full six to eight week class right now, but it is in our plans for the future. And you're right, I've been talking a lot about going and doing a few sessions in the park. The weather holds out for us, so hopefully that'll be an option. We can also kind of steer people toward the 24 form YouTube video that you and I did. Mm -hmm. So you and I are on the same page with our love of 24 form Tai Chi and it is a more advanced form than the eight, the typical eight form classes that we do here. But you can go on to YouTube and just type in Yang style, that's Y-A-N-G style, Tai Chi and you can type in Jerry and Tracy and it'll come up for you or aging partners. Yeah, it, uh, we're, we're not saying it's perfect, but it's a, it's a pretty good starting place to yes. at least learn about the 24 forms and, and at some point in time the classes are going to be offered again. Um, That's right. So uh, we want to sort of help people move forward and, and be prepared for that. So let's, let's watch at least uh, a, a short bit of this video and it'll give you some sort of indication of what to expect. Right hand on top of the ball, left foot is kick standing. Create your hook, move into single whip again. Now step up to it with your right foot, turn your palms up and float down. Left foot in kick stand position. Step forward, high pad on horse, place your palms together. Step your right foot forward, ahead of the left a little bit. Separate those hands and lift up. Very nice. You just did the next six forms, so we're moving right. So there you see a little bit about the 24 form Tai Chi, and um, we, we hope you uh, at least had your interest peaked a little bit and you'd like to go to the video and, and see more of it. Before we run out of time, we better talk about some of the other uh, classes that are going to be offered. Uh, tai Chi Moving for Better Balance um, is going to be um, East Ridge Presbyterian Church, 1135 East Ridge Drive, Tuesdays uh, from 1 to 2 and Fridays from 11 to noon. Um, the, the Qigong, uh, there's going to be a couple of different classes, Tracy. Zoom only on Mondays from 10 to 11. That's correct. Yes. And then we're going to do a, a, a session on uh, Thursday afternoons, which is going to be um, actually in person. Yes. Uh, and Qigong is becoming um, very popular, um, so it's a great class. We encourage people to do it. It deals with balance. It deals with uh, any number of things. It's, it's a great class. Yeah, it is a good class and, and uh, no jumping up and down, but it's a very good uh, class for strengthening balance. Yes, it is. I will attest to that. Uh, okay, we're going we're gonna to be out of time. Um, we encourage you um, to go to the Aging Partners website. There you see it on the screen. It's aging.lincoln.ne.gov. And the phone number, please um, take advantage of this. Uh, it's 402-441-7575. Uh, for more information, you can talk to Susan Winkler, uh, who can answer any questions you have about the classes and when they are and what the cost might be uh, and any number of those things. And, the, and there should be the flyer um, that is on the Aging Partners website. And here you see it's also going to be in Living Well magazine. Uh, it's a great resource. It should be on page 36 of Living Well magazine, all the class and event information. Very Tracy, good. thank you so much Very for being good. with us today. Um, great classes. We encourage everybody to, uh, to participate. Uh, it does add to your health, add to your fitness levels. Something for everyone. Absolutely. Right. And thank thanks you. all of you 
for sharing your time with us today. Uh, I'm your host, Jerry Renault, and remember, it's never too late to live and learn. Hi, I'm Randy Jones with Aging Partners. Did you know that Lincoln expects a 75% increase in the number of seniors living in our community over the next 15 years? Aging Partners is a community service that provides fitness programs to help keep older adults strong and healthy. This year, Lincoln Cares donations are providing funds for new fitness equipment. You can help make this happen. Sign up to support Lincoln Cares and add $1 to your LES bill each month. Welcome to Live and Learn. I'm Lita Powell Drake and we're going to be talking about the Lincoln Community Playhouse. And Maury Enders, the executive director of the Community Playhouse, is fortunately with us today. So I think you'll really appreciate that. And now what's happening with the COVID situation with regards now to coming to the Playhouse? Sure. Well, Lita, you know, um, our business model is to put as many people into the same room at the same time and we all breathe on each other, which is terrible <laughs> for COVID, right? <laughs> so we were one of the businesses shut down basically for 18 months. We're in the theater business and the performing arts, kind of the first business to close, last one to open. And that's where we find ourselves. So right as we, we prepared a season, a full season of shows, right as we're getting ready to open, COVID starts to spike again. So what can we do? So we put in some new COVID protocols that are based on Broadway protocols. Uh -huh. So um, in order to get into the Playhouse as an audience member, you're now gonna have to show your your vaccination card, oh, that you're okay. fully vaccinated. And then you're still gonna wear a mask over your mouth and nose while you're in the building. If you're unvaccinated, you can still attend, but you have to show us proof that you have a negative COVID test within 72 hours of the play. And then you're still going to have to wear your mask over your nose and your mouth while you're in the building. This is all designed to make, yeah. to, you know, so that we can still have theater but we can do it as safely as possible. So we, you know, theater is, an, is a group collaboration. Let us have a collaboration with the audience so we all can watch theater and still be safe. Yeah, well, uh, how long has the Playhouse been in Lincoln, Nebraska? The Playhouse has been around 76 years, yes. And despite my gray hair, I was not here for all of them, Lita. I was only here for 11. <laughs> 76 years, we started in a bathhouse, moved to the old synagogue, and then finally to our building on uh, uh, 56th Street uh, in 1972. Ah, and what was the first show of the season? Our first show for the season is The Fantastics, ah, ah. right? It's the world's longest running musical. The original run in New York City lasted 44 years, but you only get two weekends to see it in Lincoln at the Lincoln Community Playhouse. So The Fantastics is a charming musical about a young man and a young woman whose fathers put up a wall so that they can't fall in love, which makes them fall oh. in love. And it turns <laughs> out the fathers wanted them in love in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the Fantastics. It is a fantastic thing. <laughs> uh, what's on stage for October? In October, we have a play called Calendar Girls. Oh. And now this is a comedy. It's based on a true story. A group of women in an English uh, women's group, like a PEO club, are doing a calendar. And to raise money for uh, the local hospital, they decide, to, they decide to spice it up. And so instead of pictures of rural churches, they're going to get naked. Oh, yeah. So they're, they decide to do a naked calendar and it makes so much money and so much publicity that in the true story, it's made over like, like 10 million pounds for can, uh, blood cancer research. So it's a funny play. It's also a great uh, play about, <laughs> about self image and sisterhood. <laughs> Uh, what's coming up for November then? Uh, in November, oh, we have, oh. oh yeah, this is cool because this is a special event. We have Dick Terhune, oh, who oh. Is, is one of our legends, you know, mm. kind of our Hall of Famers. Yeah. Lita, you are also a legend, a Hall of Famer oh. at the Playhouse. Oh. <laughs> so Dick Terhune lives in Connecticut. He's a voice artist. He actually makes his living with his voice and he's a voice of cartoons and things. So he's coming back to the Playhouse to do a Christmas Carol. Oh. He is playing everybody. Oh. Yeah, so he's Scrooge, he's Tiny Tim, he's all the three ghosts. He's everybody in the whole play. How many how many characters? Is oh, that? it's like 36, 40 characters. And he does them all. He does them all. And he remembers his lines. He remembers all of his lines. <laughs> Especially God bless us everyone. <laughs> but you're gonna have two Christmas shows, are you not? That is correct. Uh -huh. Yep. So Dick Terhune with a Christmas Carol kind of ushers in the holiday season in November. And then in December we have our Penguin Project, which is gonna be Elf Jr. 
which is based on the Will Ferrell movie that a lot of people uh, mm -hmm. know and love. Um, it's our Penguin Project, so this yeah. is our show where all the roles are played by children with special needs partnered with peer mentors. So it's going to be a lot of fun and beautiful, and always with the Penguin Project, there's a lot of heart on that stage. How do these children come over there if they're impaired in some way? I mean, are they brought over there? Well, they, they have, guided? they have, we have, they are, the Penguin Project families are the, some of the greatest people you'd ever want to meet. They're so supportive of their kids, and they get them there to the, to the playhouse. We have kids who have autism and traumatic brain injury and Down syndrome and intellectual uh, disabilities and, and they do such a great job and our mentors are the most empathetic young people you'd ever want to meet. I mean if you want to see something that gives you optimism about where the oh, world's going, come to the Penguin Project. All right and in January coming up, uh, uh, what's that all about? Oh yeah, it's called Every Brilliant Thing. Another interesting show. This is also a one-person show. This one is being done by Ashley Kobza, who is uh, one of our, mm -hmm. our actors, who also is actually a director in The Penguin Project. This is a British show. It's about, a, it's one woman telling a story about her life, and when she was a child, her mother tried to commit suicide. So as a child, she starts to write up a list of every brilliant thing, and that's British, so like every wonderful thing that makes life worth living. And, and, and so as the audience comes in, Ashley will be talking to the audience and she'll be giving them cards with like a number and it'll say like 100 ice cream. And so as she's telling the, the story, she, she says, for instance, on the list, like 100. And whoever has 100 yells out, ice cream! And so the audience works with her to create the list. And it's, it's going to be dynamite. <laughs> What's on the agenda for March? In March, Mufaro's Beautiful Daughters. Now this is a, a, a children's show. It's gonna have adults and children in it. It is based on a story by John Steptoe, and it is based on, on an African legend, an African story, and it's about uh, uh, the prince of the, of the, in the area says, uh, I wanna get married, so send your daughters to me and see who will be my bride, who will be chosen as my bride. And Mufaro has two beautiful daughters. One is beautiful, on the inside and outside, one only on the outside. Mm. And they each take this journey to the royal city, and one of them, it turns out, is truly the beautiful daughter and is chosen as the bride. It's kind of an African take of Cinderella. And, all, and it is our first all-black cast, so it's a really a beautiful story, and I hope that, that folks enjoy it. All right, what's up in May then? Well, if you've noticed, most of the things that I've been saying so far have been kind of smaller scale shows. Yeah. And then we're going to blow it out big in, in May with Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. Um, this is, a, we're going to have, I mean, let's hope, we're going to have tons of people on stage, lots of people in the audience. It's, uh, it's, it's just fun. It's a 90 minute music almost like a living music video on the stage. And it's about Joseph and his coat and his brothers and how he goes and ends up becoming like the leader of Egypt uh, from the Old Testament. But it's got it's, got, it's Old Testament storyline, but oh. it's got country music and uh, Elvis music. The Pharaoh is Elvis. Elvis? Yeah. The Pharaoh, Our Elvis? Yeah, uh, the Pharaoh is Elvis in this. Yeah, so it's a lot of fun and just crazy stuff to end the season. Who makes these decisions as to which plays you're going to do? Well, do you think it's a good season? Fabulous. I, season. I make those decisions. I oh, just want to make sure oh, how yeah. you felt about it before I told you. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> so what I do is I, I look at, at, at various things, uh, you know, formulas and ideas and what's new and what's, what's trending. Mm -hmm. and, and I put that together. And then I have kind of a little consultation group that I send scripts to and say, hey, what do you think about this one and that one? Are you an actor? I am. I used to be an actor, but that was a long time ago. And you don't do it anymore. No, I don't. Well, do it once anymore. an actor, I thought always. Uh, an actor. Well, I act all the time, really. Yeah. But well, just not in on stage. many ways you should do. Yeah, yeah. But I, I'm surprised that there you know, might be uh, a part that say, "Oh, well, I, I, I can do that." Well, you know, Lita, here's here as the leader of the community theater. I think that if I were to take a role, then all I'm doing oh. is taking a role away from someone else. And I want everybody to be able to participate. And the more people who participate at the Playhouse, the better I feel. Okay. Anything else you want to know? We just have a few minutes left that people should know about what, you know, what's coming on to the Playhouse. Oh, sure. Well, I do want, uh, we have, um, um, this year we've initiated a free performance for every play. 
Oh. So, so in order, again, we're working, trying to make sure that our community playhouse is everyone's community playhouse. Oh. And we're trying to soften the doors. It's a phrase about, about making it so people feel like they can come into the playhouse and it's theirs. So sometimes people can't come because of the ticket price. Although we have to have ticket prices because we have to keep the play, yeah. play going. Uh, but um, we wanted to offer a free show for every show. So for the Fantastics, it's actually going to be a Frontline Heroes performance. Anyone who works in the hospital, the grocery stores, can come to the show for free. And then after that, it's going to be one free show. Um, if people can go to LincolnPlayhouse.com and find out when those shows will be. And they just make a reservation and come. And they can, everybody can come. Are, are you open all year round or just a portion of the year? Oh, all, all year. All spaced out throughout the year. So every show we just talked about will have a free performance. Um, uh, they, the Penguin Project with Alf Jr., our free performance is called Exceptional Family Night, where anyone in the community who has a family member who has special needs, the whole family can come to the play for free. Oh, that is so special. Yeah. <laughs> the Playhouse goes back a long way. Where were they before they are in the current situation? Sure, there? well, you Where? know, as, as the Lincoln it's Circlet Theater, that was the Circlet, circlet. that was that. I know it sounds like those little squares gum, yeah, right? Yeah. They're like chiclets, yeah. the Circlet Theater. Um, was in the Lindell Hotel. Oh yes, I went. I went to one of those All a right. long time ago. The Lindell Hotel. Yeah, oh. yeah. And they called it Circlet because they sat in a circle yeah, evidently right. and read the plays. And then that developed into the Community Playhouse, and we were in a bathhouse, which seems the weirdest thing <laughs> in the world. You know, you, you show your ticket and you get a towel on the way in. I, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> on that note, we're going to have. To <laughs> oh end no, that's it. how we're ending. <laughs> <laughs> oh. This, this is Maury at the Lincoln Community Playhouse, and we love we love it. Oh, we love you, Lita. Well, well <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. Where's the money? <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. Uh, our appreciation to Maury very much, and we'll, we'll be back next time. Vulnerable and senior adults might be living in silent fear of elder abuse and financial exploitation. We can do something about it. The Nebraska DHHS recommends that communities maintain and improve resources such as public transportation and senior centers to prevent social isolation. Engage professionals in various disciplines to find solutions to end elder abuse. Every year, June 15 is observed as World Elder Abuse Awareness Day, an opportunity to ensure justice for all. Hi everybody, welcome to Live and Learn. My name is Kim Hachia. Um, want to give a big shout out and thanks to our friends at LNK TV and Aging Partners for helping produce and, and put the show together. It's, it's a real pleasure to be able to be on the show um, in the studio. And my guest today is JJ Yost from Lincoln Parks and Recreation. We're going to be talking about Lincoln's beautiful parks. We're going to be talking about the Centennial Teacher's Fountain Project and a few other things about the park. So JJ, thanks for coming to the show today. Thank you. I'm, I'm happy to be here and looking forward to the discussion. Thanks. Why don't we talk a little bit about how many parks Lincoln has? We, I feel like we're really blessed to have a lot of really cool, lovely parks in Lincoln. And why don't you tell me a little bit about that? Absolutely, yes, and I, and I agree. We are blessed. Lincoln has a, a great um, quality parks and, and, and a good, good amount of them. We have about 130, 134 to be exact parks um, spread across the, the community. We have neighborhood parks. Um, that serve every square mile of residential development in the city. So everybody, um, pretty close, everybody in Lincoln is within about a 10 minute walk from a park. Wow, that's really interesting. And then how many, I know that we have trails, and so we, you said we have 134 parks. We have a kind of a similar n amount of trail miles, right? Yeah, that's a good point. We also have about 130 miles of trails, if you include those trails um, that, that wander through Wilderness Park. But our commuter recreation trails um, stretch to all four quadrants of the city and are very well connected. So, yeah, there's, a, there's plenty of trails to get around. Yeah, there's a trail real close to me, Rock Island, that um, that thing is heavily used. Yeah. At certain times of the day, it is just... It is packed, yes. and I, I really like that, and I appreciate that the Parks Department yeah. maintains those trails and um, maintains our parks and stuff. So one of the things we are going to talk about today is Centennial Teacher's Fountain. I don't know, do we, does it have an actual name? Well, we refer to it as the Cascade Fountain, but it okay. does, um, because of its original, uh, the original name included Centennial, and it was built around the, the bicentennial time, so um, Cascade Fountain, though, in general, is what we refer to it okay. as. 
and it's undergoing some renovation. So let's talk about why and what's going on there, and what can people expect when, when the when the big green Cheevers thing goes. Through. Yes. Okay. Which which we're getting close to. Oh, um, good. So um, yes, we are renovating Cascade Fountain. Um, really, a restoration, if you will. So the the fountain has has served the community well, been operating for years and years, but. Um, the metal piping and then the mechanical systems that serve that are, are beginning to fail. Um, there's a lot of rust. You're, you're, you're seeing an image of the existing conditions before we started renovation. Um, that pool, the pool basin that the fountain spills down into is pretty leaky. Um, and we've got a lot of rusting pipes like you're seeing now. Um, so it was just time. Um, really, we were one kind of major pipe break away from not being able to operate that fountain. So. Um, the time was now for renovation uh, and restoration, and, and we have an opportunity. It's now under construction, as you're seeing in these images. We have an opportunity to, to really make it a better place, a, a better space to serve public uses. So the, the fountain will um, very much look the same post-construction as it did before in terms of the towers. Um, they've been cleaned, but they remain uh, as, as they were in terms of the design. And then we're decreasing the size of the basin that, that was around it to reduce some of the stagnant water that would sit at the bottom of the fountain um, and maybe reduce some of that desire to, to, to try and wade in the water because honestly that water is not of a quality that we really want to have people in there swimming. It's really meant more for display purposes. Um, and, and what we're going to be able to do is create more of a plaza space, for, um, some places for people to sit uh, and picnic and enjoy the fountain, uh, maybe even have a, a place where we can do weddings or other events. Oh, yeah. So lots of, uh, lots of tables and chairs and some lighting, some things that'll really enhance the user experience as yeah. people visit the fountain. Yeah, that's such an, I, and this is a, a view of kind of what it's envisioned near the end or at the end. So that's cool with the trees and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah we'll have some shade down there and, and some opportunity to put up some banners, just some things that are gonna make it even more uh, of a friendly user space. Right, that's such an iconic part of the city, you know, right at 27th and Capitol Parkway, and it's across from Sunken Gardens, it's by the zoo, there's two trails that intersect there, so that's a real kind of heart of the city kind of thing that um, really, you know, I like that we're renovating that. There's, yeah, there's also I, that cool rose garden and all that. So. Yeah, well, there is a lot happening, right? We call that area the Antelope Triangle there next to the zoo. Um, just, just because of its geographic shape, but there are a lot of things happening there. We do, as you mentioned, we have sunken gardens there. We have the Rose Garden, the Heyman Rose Garden, the Strolling Garden. We have the Cascade Fountain and certainly the children's zoos there. And not far away is our, um, the city's largest playground, an ADA accessible playground. So um, it is probably the heart of our park system, if you will. Right. Antelope Park has been around a very long time. Uh, we're very appreciative of having that very important space. and. And Cascade Fountain, right on the corner of 20, uh, 27th and, and Capitol Parkway, couldn't be in a more prominent position. So. Right. So you said it's the project's, do we have a, a grand opening you, deadline or yes, dateline? Yes, we do. So we're, we're under construction now. That, that construction will continue through the fall. Um, and and our, you know, our plan is to rededicate, turn the fountain back on next spring. Cool. Um, so in the spring of 2022, in, in May, um, most likely May or June of next year, we'll be turning on the pumps for the first time and seeing water flow again, um, hopefully. I mean, that's the right. plan, certainly. With construction, you always uh, you know, don't, don't count your chickens before they've hatched, but, but things are going well with construction, and we're, um, we are looking we're forward, believe we're on schedule, and, and looking forward to that grand reopening. Well, I know the fountain would be turned off and on occasionally in the past several years. I, I, and I, I know it's probably because you would turn it on and there would be like gurgle, but nothing. Yes, those, those things, right. It was kind of an off again, uh, on again, off again thing where uh, mechanical systems would fail and we'd have to do some repair work or, or we'd have some kind of vandalism issue perhaps that, that, that shut us down for a while. But um, we believe the new system is going to be much more dependable and, and um, sustainable. Yeah, good, good. Well, that's, it. that's exciting. That's, that's really exciting. Yeah. So we were also going to talk about another project that you have um, yeah. going on right now, which is out, 
I don't know if it's going on yet, but it's out in airports. So let's talk about well, that. Well, it is going on in a, in a way. So we're going to be replacing the uh, existing air park recreation center. So we're in the design phase. We're starting to design a new facility, and, and you're seeing some very preliminary images of what that new recreation center and Williams Branch Library um, will be co-located with the recreation center. Um, what those will look like and um, one of the things one of the important things of this project is, is not only to get us out of the old building that really isn't serving us very well it's just aged and failing um, but we're also able to relocate to uh, we'll be adjacent to the um, Arnold Heights school which puts us on the other side of Northwest 48th Street and much closer to um, to the people that that uh, the this recreation center serve so um, we're in the design phase, as I mentioned, and the idea is that we'll be under construction in early 2022, and we'll be able to move in and, and open this new facility in um, 2023. So from the picture, it looked like there's going to be a, there's a big gymnasium, maybe, and then what other things are in a like a rec center? Yeah, so you're, you're correct. There is a gymnasium that'll be a multi-purpose gym. It can be basketball or volleyball or even indoor um, pickleball. Um, and then we've got a lot of classroom spaces um, and we've got some smaller gym spaces where we do our rock steady boxing program. Um, we can do some other kind of exercise programs. There'll be a, a little bit of a kitchen uh, associated with one of the areas so we can do some classes, some teaching classes. Yeah. And then of yeah. course I mentioned um, we'll have the Williams Branch Library that's currently in the, located in the school. They're gonna move over into this space and be co-located with us at the Recreation Center. I I'm interested in the, the idea that you're co-locating all this stuff now because that seems to be kind of the trend is to have, you know, sort of multi-use, multi-purpose, multi-agencies in, in a building like, the, you know, the, this is slightly different, but the YWCA's being at, or YMCA's yeah. being in the, in, the, in the schools or the um, police stations being in the yeah. libraries. Yeah. I, I think that's really an interesting, you know, that I like that the city is Kind of merging those things together it, it seems to be a um i don't know well, idea of the future or something i would say in, in our opinion it's a great way to to make the best uses of the community's resources we can share parking lots and and infrastructure that that you know if we might not be using them all the time but if we can co-locate and make better use of those then we don't have to double up on the amount of parking lots we build or even the amount of restrooms we build so right. um, just like the YMCA and the schools co-locating we like to co-locate with with those partners and and the libraries as well um, and share our resources and just make the most for the community yeah I mean, it seems to me too that it's a good idea just for energy savings you know you're absolutely you know why should a building be closed most of the time, yes. you know, we don't, if we don't, if we're not using schools all summer, then, although I know we do use them more now, but it just seems like a really good use of public resources to be able to um, put all that together. Yeah, we very much agree. Yeah. yeah. So as a person who does use the parks, I mean, I use the trails mostly, mm -hmm. but you know, what can I do? Um, what can I do as an individual, but what can people in Lincoln do to help support the parks department? Like, should we walk around with a, a plastic bag and pick up trash? Or well, do you we'll, guys appreciate that? We, we absolutely appreciate that. <laughs> Nobody will ever complain if, if there are volunteers out there helping pick up trash or, or, or whatever in the park. So, um, no, there are lots of ways to be involved in helping our park system, um, volunteer efforts, and, and I would encourage people to visit our website um, because we, we post those volunteer opportunities on there. We also have the Lincoln Parks Foundation mm -hmm. that, that helps us um, kind of make a difference in what we can do. Um, we obviously have limited resources, work on very limited budgets, but the Parks Foundation is a, is a way to help us do some public-private partnerships to enhance our community. So um, that's another way for people to get involved. And then um, just being out there in the parks is, is a good thing because the, you know, the more positive activities that take place in our parks, the more we displace the, the, the less wanted activities. So right. um, we really appreciate the, the, the usage, seeing the usage in the park. That's when we know we're doing things well if we've got people out there enjoying um, the services and the, and the amenities that are being provided. I know there's been a couple of situations this summer of some vandalism that's been going on in the parks, but that hopefully is is not it's kind of an uncommon thing right are, are, are parks mostly respected and people kind of 
are he, nice to them? <laughs> I, I, I want to say yes to that. You know, it goes in cycles, and, right. and when we there, there's always going to be some mischief that happens out there, and some things that happen after dark that we wish wouldn't happen. Certainly, um, but I think for the most part, people are pretty respectful of our parks, and I think there's some um, some peer pressure to to maintain those to a to a high standard. So. Um, yeah, it, it could always be better. Their um, vandalism is just just a problem um, that that costs resources. But um, for the most part, I think Lincoln's um, in pretty good shape. Yeah, I think so too, yeah. which I think is great. Yeah. yeah. Did you see an uptick in the use of the parks um, during um, COVID quarantines and lockdowns? Absolutely. Um, I don't have numbers to, to to quantify that, but I can tell you that we absolutely saw a, a real spike in the use of all our open spaces and in particular the trails. They, they really um, increased in, in usage during the pandemic and uh, it's, it's continued that way. Even our golf courses uh, have seen tremendous uptick in the amount of use. So yeah, if, if there's a, a, a positive that's come out of this, it's that people have maybe rediscovered our parks and trails. Yeah, yeah. I, you and I had talked earlier about the sort of the wildlife that you see in the parks too, which I also think is a real plus for the city that we, you know, you can see wild turkey and deer and all sorts of things yeah. in, in Antelope Park. And yeah. <laughs> may not be a great thing for a driver to encounter that, but you know, we do see that. It, it is, an, there's an opportunity out there. If you look, it, it's always there somewhere. Um, our, our green spaces, our park spaces, um, provide a little connection to nature here in the within the city limits and there are a lot of wildlife um, that call those parks home. Yeah, yeah, which I think is great. Everybody yeah. has a home here in Lincoln. That's yeah. right. Well, JJ, we are out of time. Thank you so much for me, being my guest today. I really enjoyed learning about Cascade Fountain. I will now try to call it that <laughs> instead of instead of Bicentennial Fountain, but um, I appreciate you being here and uh, thank you. Uh, absolutely, my pleasure. I love talking about these projects. Thanks. Yeah. I want to remind our viewers that it's never too late to live and learn about Lincoln City Parks. Hi, I'm Randy Jones with Aging Partners. Did you know that Lincoln expects a 75% increase in the number of seniors living in our community over the next 15 years? Aging Partners is a community service that provides fitness programs to help keep older adults strong and healthy. This year, Lincoln Cares donations are providing funds for new fitness equipment. You can help make this happen. Sign up to support Lincoln Cares and add $1 to your LES bill each month. Hello and welcome to Live and Learn. I'm your host, Jerry Renault. A rather interesting, unique event has taken place in the last few weeks here in the city of Lincoln, Nebraska and that was the naming of a new high school. It was the very first time that it has ever been named after a person, and it's going to be <clears throat> Chief Standing Bear, which is going to be the name of the new high school, which I think is fabulous. Here to tell us uh, and give us some thoughts about why that's important is Judy Goshkabash. She is the Executive Director of the Nebraska Commission on Indian Affairs. I hope I got that right. You did, Jerry. Very Thank good. you for having me here today to oh. talk about such exciting changes in our city and state and world. Yes, uh, mm -hmm. and it is very exciting. And we, we want to talk about Chief Standing Bear in a, in a number of different ways today. But um, I, I feel very compelled to, to want to talk about you, uh, first of all. Okay. I know you are. <laughs> Uh, very humble. You don't like talking about this, so let me let me brag on you. I just think you are one of the really key people in this city um, uh, and the state that 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 deals with um, issues of justice and civil rights. Doesn't matter whether it's Native people, whether it's Black people, Brown people, women, men. Uh, you are there to, to take up that cause, and I think that's wonderful. And you recently uh, received an award, and I want to make sure I get this right. It's the Lori Camp Smith. Integrity in Service Award from the Omaha Bar Association, uh, which I think is is very cool. Tell us a little bit about Lori and why it's important that, that we have this award. She was really, a, a, again, somebody who fought for human rights in the state. Uh, I was very blessed to work with Lori. When I started in my job as the director of the Indian Commission, 25, coming up to 26 years will be my 26th year, she was just starting over at the Attorney General. Uh, she had come from working, I think, as an attorney for Rhodes. And so she was a public servant, a person that could have had a private practice and, you know, done all that, but she wanted to serve our state. And so I myself uh, work for the state, and so I feel like I 
have that in common with her that we served our state and maybe we could have made um, a bit more lucrative but in the what I do for native people in the state I feel like I'm a cultural mediator and Judge Smith Camp, she was such a fair person that never judged people. She uh, respected all people. So way at the very beginning, we became kind of allies and friends. And I'd see her at the Capitol and every day coming and going. And then as life went on, uh, we got to starting to work on a lot of different projects, uh, some with Standing Bear. And um, so she was like a hero to me and a role model. And, she went to D.C. Uh, to Statuary Hall for the dedication. She did so many things. I was working with her on a project uh, with the courts uh, prior to her untimely passing to help give pro bono uh, counsel to women, uh, Native people that weren't receiving that. Nice. So uh, I can't say enough how such an honor. It's sad that I have to receive an award under those circumstances, yeah. but I admire this person so much and to be the first woman, and she did so much for women's rights. She was a real advocate oh, uh, yeah. for equality that um, I can't, uh, I'm just really humbled and the family, they're just so wonderful and she really will, her legacy will live on and um, I always had her as an ally. Uh, one time when I first went to White Clay to work with her, she was doing the work out there and we flew in a little plane and all the way there, while a couple other people on the plane took a nap, she wanted to know about what was going to happen. And I always say, to be interesting, you must be interested. And that's the kind of person she was. She always was uh, wanting to know about other people and she never thought she was above other people and that's what I call being standing very strong and humble. She was a great person and it's a it's a great honor for you to have to have gotten the award so so it congratulations. Is. It is. Thank you. Okay. Terry. Standing Bear. Um, I, I tell you this story I, I, I don't want us to get too bogged down uh, with the entire story but I was with some people when the announcement came down about naming this new high school after Chief Standing Bear. And the reaction from these people was like, well, who is this? And I, I go, doesn't everybody know who, this, who Chief Standing Bear is and why he is so important to not only Native people, not only to Nebraskans, but to the entire country and perhaps the world? Um, maybe we need to just go back very briefly, tell the story of, of Chief Standing Bear, why it is so critical and important. You want me to tell yes, the story? If you would, oh boy. Well, I am a member of the Ponca tribe, so this story yep. is very uh, personal to me. But uh, in 1877, uh, the government decided that they needed to free up space for um, the new people coming in, the immigrants, and they needed to get us out of our homelands along the Niobrara. Uh, so, to make room for the Warring Sioux, who they were more concerned about, and keep them over there. Standing Bear and our tribe was forced to go on our march, our Trail of Tears, as some call mm -hmm. it, down to Oklahoma. And uh, they made it down there, some dying, many dying along the way. Uh, it was just really a horrible. We, they went to Red Earth, where up here we had black soil and uh, a lot of diseases. And Standing Bear's son, his 16 year old son, Bear Shield, died. Uh, and on his deathbed, he asked his father to return him home and bury him along the Niobrara River right. with our ancestors there. So against the law, under the orders, you know, to not leave the reservation or the lands that they had been taken to, Standing Bear walks all the way back, you know, 500 miles back to honor his word to his son, his dying son. And then he was arrested and taken to Fort Omaha. Uh, at that point in time, we were not considered human beings. Right. And so then we have a trial and, um, we were, the case was that the results were that we were human beings. Right, yeah, he made a great impassioned speech. Um, he did. To, to, the, to the judge and, and to, the, to the courtroom. Mm -hmm. And that's when the judge sort of issued this decree and said, you are a man, you are I'm a, a real man, person. I'm a man, the same, you know. And so he got to go home and bury his son, Bear Shield. Yeah. So that's the story and uh, so many people don't know that story. And we didn't become citizens until 1924 even though this happened in 1879. Right. 
So the first peoples of Nebraska and of America. And in the center of the United States of America, the Ponca, this trial, this case, made all tribal nations human beings. Right. I don't think it ever would have happened in 1924 if it hadn't have been, if it hadn't been for that trial. And, and exactly. And standing there. Well, also military service. Right. That was what really oh, yeah. uh, the Citizenship Act and all because of so many of our native men were warriors and we love our homeland. We have nowhere to go back home <laughs> to learn our languages and all that, you know, as some people do the European, uh, they can go back to another country. Sure. So uh, we fight to protect our homelands at a very high rate in military service, men and women. So we're going to have Chief Standing Bear High School, which I just... Uh, Isn't that great? I, I, it is just I fabulous. Love it. I love I absolutely do too. Tell me, at least from your perspective, why this is so important. Well, for one thing, they were courageous to uh, take a different route and, oh, you yes. know, the path you choose in life, they didn't go with a direction. Uh, they, they chose someone that was uh, clearly an outstanding Nebraska citizen. And I wasn't directly involved in that. Uh, so I just want to say that the power of the story of Standing Bear, when people have learned that over the years, more and more people are learning it. And they're moved by the story. Who doesn't want to uh, honor their word and do right by their family? And who doesn't love their home? And who wouldn't want to not be taken by, you know, out of your house and say, you've got to move. This is no longer yours. So I think uh, what really I am so happy about is that over the years, I've done a lot of things to tell the story of Standing Bear through our Standing Bear breakfasts. And uh, there have been books and documentaries made. So. Uh, the people in Lincoln were wise enough and they saw that as an opportunity to have someone that we can admire be that person at their school. And so going forward, what I think is really cool is all the students that go to that school. And I don't know how many students they have. Do you know how many students? Uh, I, I'm sure it will be uh, probably a class A school. It, uh, it will be 500 of, students. Oh, I probably be more than that. Even. Okay. So just imagine 500 to 1,000 students graduate from that school. My daughters went to Lincoln Southeast. So all of your classmates, your uh, school mascot, your school name is Standing Beer. Right. And I am going to be involved in integrating this into, they're going to work with the Ponca tribe and I've been asked to be involved in that. Oh, so good. there'll be ways that um, we can maybe have a, uh, some day where they um, honor somebody that acts like Sandy Bear, in the spirit of Sandy Bear. And all the graduates will leave that school. They'll most likely know something about Sandy Bear oh, yes. and the First Peoples. They'll be proud about that. They'll take that story with them. That will go out into the world and we will see good things going on and people will have more regard and learn about the First Peoples. Yeah. So it's a win-win. Yeah. It's, it's really so wonderful. Yeah. I can't tell you how. It's hard to believe. Oh, I know. You know, it really is hard to believe that in Lincoln, Nebraska, that we have a school named yeah. after Stanley Bear. And you, you mentioned the, the mascot, which is, has been this interesting controversy with professional sports teams and universities and even some high schools. And now we've sort of turned that on its head and said, we're going to name it after a Native American. Yes. So I don't know if the mascot will be a bear, maybe. Uh, it'll be I don't what, think they've decided yet. They haven't. That. They haven't decided. But they're really open to doing it right. So I really commend uh, the Lincoln uh, School Board and the principals and the students. And they. this is a great opportunity to, you know, like you said, turn things on their head. Yeah. Um, let's talk about uh, at least one other uh, thing involving Standing Bear, um, and that is the tomahawk um, that he tomahawk, owned. Um, yes. Now, as I understand, he gave this tomahawk to one of the lawyers at this trial um, as sort of a gift for, for helping him, but somehow that tomahawk ended up leaving the state and is now at uh, a museum back east, and um, Nebraska and the Ponca tribe are trying very hard to bring it back to Nebraska. Is that correct? That's true. That is true. Most likely, Standing Bear had two tomahawks. Oh, okay. You know, one was probably what he used in everyday uh, work, like, you know, we all have a broom or a rake or sure. whatever you use. And then you have the, the nice one that you keep for special. And um, so 
uh, he laid it down as a symbol of change, a way, change of life and he gave it as a gift. He didn't have much to give. He would have given the shirt off his back to show his appreciation for the ruling in the decision. So then it gets out there to the Peabody, uh, Harvard, and we didn't know anything about it. The Ponca chairman, Larry Wright Jr., the tribe didn't know it was there. And it was brought to our attention. So once it was brought to our attention, uh, we then began a dialogue with the Peabody. And um, they have really been uh, reasonable, and I think Jane Pickering is the uh, head of the Peabody Museum, and I've visited with her on the phone and had emails. We will be going in September. I've been invited to go with the tribal uh, delegation out to uh, see them and meet with them. Oh, good. And, um, uh, Dr. Philip Deloria, he is a professor there, and he, I think, is the chair of their NAGPRA committee. And so we feel good about that because he's a native person that we know and trust. We, it, we'll get it back, and it's going to come back. Good. Where it will be, I don't know yet, but it should come back to our state because it does have meaning and purpose here. And they, I think they see that too. Good. And I also think they're going to do some other good things to work with uh, the Ponca tribe and tribal people, sort of an educational um, exchange of sorts. Very so nice. we're going to take something that could have been kind of negative and make it positive in the spirit of Standing Bear. Very nice. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have about um, 30 seconds left. Let's talk very briefly about Indigenous Peoples Day next okay. October. Okay, uh, next October 11th, we are going to have uh, Nebraska's first Indigenous Peoples Day, and we will on that day do something besides Standing Bear. We will unveil the uh, seven and a half foot sculpture done by Benjamin Victor of Dr. Susan the Flesh Picot, oh, good. a member of the Omaha tribe, and she was America's first native doctor. Her elder sister was Suzette LaFleche Picot, and she was the interpreter of the trial of Standing Bear, so there's a connection. That is located right across from the state office building. And uh, that plaza there, there's a map of Nebraska there. So that's where it will be, so we invite everybody to come and celebrate with us. We'll start down in front of Standing Bear. 25 historic tribes will be invited to bring their flags. We'll have drum groups, song, march up to that plaza. We've invited uh, the first Native woman, Interior Secretary Deb Holland, oh, yes. to be there. And then we'll have our ceremony there. Then we'll move in to the Capitol, where for the first time ever, our four headquartered tribes will have their flags per a bill that I worked on in the state capitol. And then after that, we'll come out and we'll go to the Scottish Rites Temple for a gathering, a luncheon that the tribes in Nebraska are hosting. So it's a day for Nebraska to be so proud and we want everyone there to join us to celebrate Dr. Wonderful. Susan LaFleche Picot, Standing Bear, all of our tribal nations. Maybe we'll have you back to talk about that. If okay, you I'd love to. Judy Goshkawash, thank you so much for being thank with you, us Jerry. today. And thanks to all of you for being with us today. I'm your host, Jerry Renault, And remember, it's never too late to live and learn. <laughs>